So I wanted to have a conversation with who I think are some of the smartest minds, most brilliant people, and some of those that are leading the nation, if not the globe, in having us impact, uh, having this impact. So I want to start with asking them to introduce themselves. I'm Carl Dieferbach. I am the director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases um, at the NIH. And I am here because we have a footprint that is global. We also are trying to establish a footprint in the most important, most uh, challenged communities across the, the United States. My name is David Parire Nyatwa. I am the president of Society for AIDS in Africa. And uh, I know that here, the Society for AIDS in Africa is well represented. All the board members that are sitting there in those caps, including the colleague next to me. But I'm very excited by this potential collaboration between Appalachia and Africa. And as you know, the Africa region with a population of over 1.2 billion is really a massive, uh, uh, if you like, entity to talk about and to, to try and encapsulate. But clearly the key issues that we look at is sexually transmitted infections, HIV, TB, malaria, was a key and other very infectious diseases that are coming to the fore uh, in, this, in these areas. And that, the issue of how you mobilize primary health care, mm. whether you want to call it any other name, but essentially it's primary health care, that includes a village health workers, community health workers, and others. My name is Mariah K. Upang. I also am a member of the uh, Society for AIDS uh, board, and it's a real big pleasure um, to be discussing this topic. Um, for me, the key thing is making the shots. I do appreciate that um, Africa and Appalachia is not just common in terms of the A, the word starting with A, but also the fact that there are rural areas, but knowing Africa is more significant because 60% of its population live in the rural area, and that has significant issue for us. So when you're talking about the shots, I think for me, we have finally gotten somewhere in thinking about what is really um, germane for the African population. Shots are a lot more important than pills in our own health system um, paraphernalia uh, for many reasons, including stigma. Uh, and that came up very strongly in the last session that was here. Um, and then going forward, noting community health workers, and just to know that this is a very big issue, central to the discussion on the continent currently, including African citizens making a major plan, mobilizing resources to empower CW, uh, community health workers who have effectively responded to the pandemics and the epidemics on the continent. So this is a critical discussion for me and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. My name is Simpurike Mofai. I'm the Candidate Director for Mothers to Mothers Lesotho. And I've been working for Mothers to Mothers for 15 years now. And I started as an implementer and now providing the strategic, uh, strategic vision at Mothers to Mothers in Lesotho. I think I'm combining the two. Now I'll be giving the, the work at the ground as well as the strategic vision of Mothers to Mothers. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sal Otter. Uh, I am an infectious disease doc and director of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute in West Virginia. It's a statewide organization. We have uh, multiple partners across the state, including 131 primary care sites. Uh, you should know that I actually grew up in the AIDS epidemic. I was an intern in San Francisco in 1980, saw AIDS before we knew it was AIDS. And before coming to West Virginia, uh, I ran the AIDS program at Newark, New Jersey. Uh, West Virginia historically had among the lowest prevalence of HIV in the country. And uh, because of that, the testing, the linkage to care were not as well developed as places like Newark, New Jersey. Unfortunately, the cars on the train for other epidemics, HIV epidemics, are on uh, Tony's train as well, as well. And those are discrimination, uh, poverty, and stigma. Uh, and so I really look forward, the difference between uh, Newark and West Virginia is the rural area, the isolation, uh, the lack of a history of robust, as I said, uh, uh, you know, resources to address HIV. So I really look forward to this discussion and the collaboration. Um, good day, everyone. I'm Azri Takarani. I'm from the HIV Vaccine Trial Network in South Africa. 
Uh, it's also part of the National Institute of Health funded networks, and I see Wafa is in the audience there. She's from the HIV Prevention Trials Network, which is our sister network. So we mainly work in the um, uh, prevention space, trying to find prevention modalities for HIV. Um, in clinical research, I regard myself as a clinician scientist, but I think um, one of the most eye-opening things has been when we had COVID um, and in our communities, even when we got to a point where we actually had a vaccine, so we had literally made the shot and it was available and people were unable to access it. And this was largely because the science had been too far removed and the development of the vaccine was not well communicated within the community. So I think that our networks have always had a strong kind of community engagement unit and bringing the community along. But since then, I think we've strengthened our resolve even more. We use a lot of community advocates to demystify the science and make it accessible to people. And we kind of see it as the beginning of the continuum. So before we try to get people to access health services when they're available, if they understand the signs and how we move and how we got the, model, the different modality, the treatment modalities, then it um, actually strengthens or um, enables access. Yeah, and so that's the perspective that I'm going to be bringing today. Perfect, thank you so much. When we think about rural communities, I think, you know, if you think about them in the U.S., people think about long, dusty roads, et cetera. Or they say, well, you know, you can address the problem with telehealth and telemedicine. But the thing is, is that I want to know what are some of the, the successes that we've seen in rural communities and what was the region like, right? So I want to talk about both things at once. Right, because I know, for example, Sally, some of the work that you're doing, uh, you and Judith Feinberg are doing around hepatitis C, for example, of bringing in and training primary care providers to be able to provide hep C screening and testing and offer treatment, right? But how do you do that when you might have folks that are living up in hollers and they don't have access to the doctor that you just trained? So first of all, Sally, tell me about your models of training around physicians and community health workers, because you've got both. You and you Judith have both, right? Right. Um, so I'll just sort of take you back a little bit with the advent of the really effective uh, hepatitis C agents. Actually, as all effective programs start, it started in the community, and they came to us. And they said, we have you know, lots and lots of chronic hepatitis C patients. You've got these drugs that, that cure more than 95%. We don't know how to use them. State Medicaid is requiring that they see an infectious disease or hepatitis C uh, hepatologist in West Virginia. Wait times were six to nine months, never mind the fact that it was often three hours or more of travel time to, to a specialist. And so the primary care providers in rural West Virginia said, you got to do something. And what we did was we implemented the extension for community health work for health care outcomes. This was originally developed uh, in uh, at the University of New Mexico. Uh, expert panel meets uh, every couple weeks. 15 minutes of didactic CME is given, and then there are case presentations. And through that, and I, I, as I told folks, I said, you know, hepatitis C is a lot easier to manage than all the other stuff primary care physicians manage, you know, diabetes, hypertension, and so forth. And uh, the state of West Virginia, after seeing the data, and we collected the data, uh, I don't think it was the most, uh, you know, elegant study ever done, but the data really showed that people were connected, they were getting care in their communities, and they were being cured of hepatitis C. And West Virginia Medicaid then removed that, that uh, requirement, which was huge. I think that the, if they were presented at ECHO, that was the subspecialty requirement met. Uh, I think the issue that you bring is, so how do you reach the people in the hollers? That's where the community health workers come. Largely, um, primary care clinics in West Virginia communities are people of the community. But transportation down the hauler, some people are sitting there going, what the heck is a hauler? <laughs> <laughs> a hauler is an area, usually a valley, far removed. It will be a country road in West Virginia where people live and are congregated at some distance from, uh, you know, sort of the um, 
what I would say is a village or town and often really not connected to many of the modern services such as sewer systems and so forth that we have. So it's really quite rural and often, you know, uh, uh, what you think might not occur in the United States. It does. It really does. And so community health workers, and there are a number of groups in West Virginia that have them and are training them. And I'll just touch on the third thing, which is telemedicine. Roughly 30% of folks in West Virginia, mostly in the southern part of the state, don't have broadband. Uh, you know, they, they really cannot connect. So that is a problem that is being worked on. But for those that can connect, actually hepatitis C clinics with virtual visits and telemedicine have actually more uh, a better uh, appointments, more appointments kept than the others and better retention in care. So I think telemedicine is useful, but you still need the community health workers to connect to the primary care clinics. Carl, you picked up the mic, so that was like you were ready. Yeah, so I want to start um, in Africa with um, the role of, and reaching into rural communities. And the way that has worked best for research is pure embedding in the community. A primary example of that is the Rakai community um, in, um, in Uganda, where uh, groups have been working since the early 90s uh, continuously um, with NIH support to really take a community fair approach. So there's a sign that goes out that we will be in your neighborhood um, on an annual basis and you come, people come to the, um, the fair, they get their blood pressure screened, they get their overall health um, dealt with, they get tested for HIV, um, they are now providing PrEP and treatment through this kind of an approach. Now to flip back to the United States, there's a very interesting program that is just being launched by the new director of the NIH, Monica Bertinoli. She is very engaged in the idea of primary care physicians in rural communities forming essentially a hub and spoke type system for clinical trials for a, a variety of diseases that really are needed, need research activities in rural communities. And I think that, that for the NIH um, AIDS research side, we may be able to partner with these as they get stood up so that we are not, you know, we have always tried to focus where the disease is most prevalent, which is the big cities, inner cities, um, really needing to now move into the southern United States uh, to deal with uh, young black men and, and, um, and cisgendered women. So I think there's going to be a, a, the ability to really shift um, and do more reaching into communities through this type of a program. So we've been dealing with HIV, many of us, most of us in this room, for 20, 30 years in one way or another. Many people in the Appalachia region have not been. This is new to them. Hey, this is, we're talking five years in. They're like, we don't know that the stigma is at a level of, well, is it and still a gay disease? We're not having a stigma about treatment access. We're having a stigma about some real basic things. But then we've got the cultural stigma where they, and we've got a predominantly white community that doesn't really deal with outside influences at all. It's not a very trusting group of people. So I, I just really feel like if we could in some way begin to have this cultural exchange that maybe we create that first tier of people in the region that say, no, that's not true about that group or that race or those people because I worked with so-and-so from so-and-so. And that maybe we can begin to change a whole region's mindset. I think that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is that we just received some funding at my organization, Community Education Group, where what we want to do is use MAT providers, medically assisted treatment providers who are providing treatment for substance use disorder. I think that that's where a large percentage of the 20, 24 percent of people living with HIV, 50 percent of Hep C cases that we can't find. I think they're coming through those MAT clinics and we don't test them enough for HIV, we don't test them enough for hepatitis C, and we don't test them enough for STIs. Are you seeing in your communities high rates of substance use disorder? Is substance use disorder a factor at all 
Uh, are you seeing it? Is it a problem? Is it a challenge in Africa? I know it's a challenge in Appalachia. Uh, Carl, are you guys doing any work around substance use disorder, HIV, and the syndemic? Are you guys doing any work in that space? And I'm gonna to come to you in a minute and talk to you about key populations, because I, I really want ICASA to do a bigger piece on key populations at the next conference, but I'll talk, yeah, because I always got an idea. So again, substance use disorder um, it occurs in pockets. And I think there are cities and regions that are heavily impacted and other countries and other regions that are not. One thing is that's universal, is STIs. And I think that, that that's probably the major syndemic uh, that um, we are facing domestically um, and um, internationally. I mean, the rates of STIs, in, for example, in the uh, most recent antibody trial uh, that the HPTN used were off the charts um, in, um, in women. Uh, so I think that you have to Coming back to all politics and everything needs to start at the local, at the community level. And so you need people at the community level that understand, have their fingers on the pulse of where we are, where that community is, that can then mobilize. And so that's where having an informed group in, whether it's cities, counties, um, local jurisdictions, that are linked to their health departments. And that's the other problem, is really making sure that the health departments, at least in the United States, are in power. I realize when you're in a red state, that's really tough. Um, it's not a political statement, it's a true statement. So I think we need to really think about how we can, at the federal level, profit from the experiences at the local level and make sure that we are bridging that gap. Um, CDC does that pretty well. The Ryan White clinics do that pretty well. But more could be done in that space. Yeah, I think, um, Tony, that's a very good idea what you're talking about. And I think it's something that Maranike also touched on. Um, speaking about how we probably develop these community health workers in silos. And um, we have the same problems in the community and we're not making kind of like a generalist community health worker who can touch on several things at the same time, right? I mean, so it's really very important. I think the idea of introducing the maps and um, bringing the STIs and the substance um, induced disorders into one piece and one person probably promulgating the messages, including cardiovascular risk and all the other things is the way to go because these will then become the people at the, the go-to person in the community who can um, then be trusted with information, all sorts of health-related health, health related information. Um, and in the long run, um, epidemics evolve, yeah. um, but every community will always be plagued by something. So you just kind of bring in that sustainability element when you have a cadre that is well equipped to deal with pra practically anything and everything, and not just to think about HIV prevention on this side and substances on this side, and then have an uncommunicable disease person on the other side. So I think it's really, really very important. And then coming back to the cultural exchange, I mean, I was very excited when you started this conversation, and I think it's really because of what Morinika says. It's all about implementation research right, or translational science. How do we then get these things to really work in the community? And so perhaps um, in Africa and Appalachia, we're in different places, um, or we're facing different factors, but I think the frameworks and the techniques, we can learn a lot from each other, and we can quickly exchange and look at quick wins and quick gains that each of us can go back and implement in our communities instead of trying to kind of rebuild or reinvent the wheel continually um, as we try to understand each community in silos again. So I think back to this thing about being cross-cutting and that's what um, ensures sustainability. Question. Hi. So I want to understand from the panelists why we're so afraid to talk about certain things. I'm going to give you one right now. As many of half West Virginian military veterans of all age suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, 
according to a new study, is an NIH study. It's, that's no big surprise. This is the 25th World AIDS Conference. I've gone through the agenda with a fine tooth cult, and someone made the mistake of teaching me how to read. <laughs> and you know what? There's not one session on veterans. There's two posters from the VA. You're going to have so many veterans from the Ukraine and Russia getting infected. who are going to be going back to rural areas. And yet, this foul right state that we keep on not allowing veterans in as key populations, and that veterans organizations have no chance whatsoever. The BFW, the American Legion, Vietnam, uh, Afghan and Iraq vets against the war, they have no chance of getting an R01 or a PO1 or an SBIR because we haven't changed study section to allow for unknown or it's not unknown, you know it's not unknown, unrecognized populations to come in. And we want to start talking about key pops. We need to start talking about why we can't accept other key pops. Because what this is, is Hunger Games. We keep them off the radar. We intentionally do it. And I just want to understand, after coming to this conference for a more than 20 years as an HIV positive combat veteran, why do you hate us so much? What did we do to you? You sleep under the blanket of freedom we provided, and you won't study it, but watch in 10 years what happens in the Ukraine and in Russia. You're talking about PEPFAR? You won't have enough PEPFAR money from now until the end of time to solve those problems, and it's going to come from veterans. So please, my question, why do you hate veterans so much? I, you know, I really like Carl answer that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like Carl answered that, but I, you know, but I actually, I think I don't think we do. You know, I think that actually we've gotten some really good data out of the VA, particularly around hepatitis. I think we've gotten some really good data out of uh, out of the out of the um, out of the VA on uh, being able to actually do implementation. Of, a, of, of uh, Hep C treatment and care for veterans. Tony, I, I love you. Not one section. Yeah. Not I, one I, listen, section. Listen, you know what? You know what you should do then? Let me tell you what you should do. Vote for me to get on the committee for the speaker for the panel that will review sessions uh, in 2025 or 2020, and I'll get on there and I'll make sure that there's a veterans panel. Go ahead. So I think we're, let's not conflate two things here. Yeah, so, yeah. That's a good I think the, the presence of what's in this meeting is a reflection of inherent bias that goes into the meeting year after year after year. That doesn't mean that there isn't work going on in the VA that is part of linkage to um, Centers for AIDS Research. We have a v that many of the VA hospitals are tied in. Uh, so. There is work going on, David, as you know, um, but I, I think to say that we hate veterans is insulting, and I feel in some ways very personally insulted, because I have always given you, you have. the time of day and um, opportunities to express your opinion. Everything you say and have said to me over the years, there's always been a grain of truth. And it's my job to find that grain of truth and act on it. But for this specific event, there is a level of research that's going on. It's just, um, it's not, a tr the, the people at the VA are choosing not to come to this meeting. They're not submitting their abstracts. So again, if we call the session, let's see what we get. Okay. Maybe the thing to do is start with a satellite um, in two years and see um, what kind of, interested it attracts. So let's do an experiment. Yeah, I think, and, I, and David, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be honored to do that with you because we've got some good Dr. Yeah, Reedy. Right, that, that, right now, we've got Dr. Reedy, who is actually in West Virginia uh, in, the, in the panhandle. He and I have actually discussed this issue of, of, of veterans, HIV, veterans, and hepatitis C. I'll talk to you after the session. Next. Hi, my name is Megan Latoya, um, and I am a Fogarty Fellow at Harvard University. Um, so I want to introduce myself a little bit and give you some of my uh, bona fides. I am a hillbilly. I am an Appalachian American. Um, my mother has 13 siblings. My father has 18. 
um, and I grew up without electricity or water. So actually hearing this, so at first I just want to acknowledge that I never expected in Munich, Germany, to be having a discussion about people like me, people who came from a place like me, and also um, this kind of like, we can learn something from Africa to bring into the community rather than always exporting knowledge to Africa. So first of all, I'm just surprised you would talk about haulers here today at all. So that's very, yeah. Yeah, right? Good. Go Russ. Oh, yeah, represent all the hillbillies. So my question is, also, I work in Zambia, so I do have, I, I do work in Africa. Um, so my question is about um, community health workers. So you mentioned empowering community health workers, these community health worker-led models, and I really love them. We have implemented them in, um, in Zambia, specifically for neurological outcomes of children who've been exposed to HIV. But in my research right now, what I found is that a lot of the community health workers are finding that we are just task shifting and task shifting over and over and over again to these community health workers. It's not a profession. It's, it's kind of a last resort opportunity. It's usually underpaid women. And so for us, we have huge burnout. We have women who are complaining all the time, who spend a lot of time trying to um, negotiate salaries. And honestly, they just don't feel like they can provide that type of care under the conditions that um, we give them. So for both Appalachia and the continent, um, how do we strike a balance between that like, community health worker-led program and care in a way that kind of gives us good quality um, equity to non-Appalachian people? I'd like to start by saying I think that you're 100% right in this way. That I think if we don't balance out policy with the implementation of community health worker models in this way, that those certifications have to be things that can be built back to things like Medicaid and third-party insurers. It can't just be a volunteer exercise. It has to be that we're thinking about this from a construct of workforce development and economic development and self-empowerment for the individual, because you're, you're right again in that it's majority women. And in many instances, these women are head of household. So these have to be not just a sustainable wage, these have to be living wages. That's why in our mind, we look at the 27000 the $32,000 range in West Virginia, that's a living wage in the Appalachia region, right? If I put that same person in New York, that's no money. But if I then also make sure that that person through our policy team, that guy right there, that we make sure that what we're doing is that we're making sure that those models, those, they can get a certificate. They can then take that certificate, again, can be billed to Medicaid, that certificate is the thing that could give them the key to say, I want to get this training, but oh, maybe I want to get certified as an X also. We see it as an entry point into workforce development, not an exit, right? So it's the first time that a person may get any sort of kind of certificate for anything. Maybe they're not a high school graduate, mm -hmm. but what they are is they're known in their community. CDC has a model called the popular opinion leader model, right? It was one of their interventions that they had back in the day when they would focus on interventions. And what we really realized with popular opinion leader is that people in community who know people in community trust people in community. We, we talked a bit about COVID, and one of the things that West Virginia did, many people don't know, West Virginia was the leader in vaccination for a while. Not because it was like brilliant in everything it did, but that what one of the things that Clay did is that he said, Instead of going to big box stores, what we're going to do is go to small and local pharmacies first. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people know those people. Mm -hmm. They're going to take a vaccine from those people. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to train these community health workers. We've got to get them certified, not just certified for cert certification's sake, but to make sure that they're validated within a bigger system of medicine, of care, of mm -hmm. treatment, but of opportunity. Uh, my name is Goldnar Drasta, I'm a senior uh, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, and I'm also the Managing Director of the LGBT Center in Greater Cleveland. So uh, my question is, what are the accountability mechanisms that you are going to put in place, and this is specifically for Carl, because I'm coming from a U.S. context, <laughs> around what are the accountability mechanisms put in place to make sure that these organizations that are getting millions of dollars, but none of those resources are transferring over into community, and yet the community is bearing the burden of doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing around POL, we run a POL program in Cleveland, 
And we have found great success, especially during COVID and MPOX. And now I think that the next natural evolution is exactly what you're talking about. And I've been trying to have conversations about how do we create a community health worker track that is focused on LGBTQ plus public health to address chronic conditions when there are significant disparities, especially in Cleveland, between BIPOC populations and white populations, but also BIPOC queer populations. Yeah. Cleveland, the average age of a trans black woman is 30 to 35 years old. That is the average life expectancy, right? And so how do we create the capacity? How can we make sure that the dollars are going to small organizations like ours so that we can do this work, continue to do this work without having to bear the reporting mechanisms that go with these federal funds because we don't have capacity to do all of that and to deal with Medicaid billing and all of that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'd love to connect with you afterwards, but that's my main question. I think the way to go with this is we'll talk afterwards. I'm Linda H. Scrubs. I'm in Largo, Maryland from Ribbon, the Center of Excellence. And um, I thank this young lady for um, talking about community health workers and a multidiscipline unit of community health workers, looking at community health workers from a chronic disease lens and not from an HIV lens. People living with HIV, in particular as we're aging, we're living chronic disease lives with comorbidities. And you're right, Tony, it's such a low-hanging fruit, whether you're in the Appalachians or you're in D.C. Community health workers who are trained, they're going to be paid less than everyone, and they're really going to hit from a community model. I know I've been saying this for 20 years when I learned about community health workers, been training community worker health workers in this space. Carl, I would really love, and we have been most unsuccessful in the U.S., connecting with the Department of Labor. This is a labor issue. This isn't a Ron White issue. We would benefit through Ron White, but we can we need to connect with federal partners who have leverage. It's around the wheel and that everything can't don't have to say HIV. People living with HIV qualify for a number of things that don't say HIV. And I know part of my big part of my job has been teaching community how to scratch out HIV and go apply and qualify in other places. But it would be great if we had partners who had the will to talk to their colleagues, because often HHS and folks have tables that we can't get access to. Because again, you're right, this is low hanging fruit, it's billable, and we already have the data of what community does. The outcome, we had, it's not how, we, don't, we didn't have to do a research study. I'll, I'll, next thing I'll add is, also around where is the federal, as well global response, around intentionally incorporating community at all levels of research from the very beginning. How, begin, how do we become intentionally part of the decision making, part of the design? Many of us have been here working with you 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Even without research credentials, we sit in partnership spaces and we keep talking about key populations we won't find them, we won't work with them unless you invite us who they are their trusted partners to be part of that space. That's about a will. That's not that you can't. That's about there's not a will to really bring us in at all levels of clear engagement. Uh, Linda, I think we should talk when we are back in Washington. Uh, we really need to revitalize the national HIV AIDS strategy. And right. When that was really under the Obama administration, labor was at the table, um, justice was at the table. All the organizations that touched um, HIV were part and parcel of the program. It's whittled down now where uh, these, or these groups have been able to walk away. I think we really need to get back to um, a national HIV AIDS strategy that is all inclusive and deals with uh, this problem in a holistic way. We continue to talk about the ideas need to come from community, community needs to be at the table from day one. And that is an ongoing battle and constant fight. And we will continue to fight with you to make that succeed. Yeah, I just yes. want to, okay, go for it. Oh, because he's going to do it in information uh, that is relevant. I'm doing historical. Yeah. Okay. My name is Sheila Tlo. I'm a, uh, a, a board member for SAR, 
but um, former Minister of Health of Botswana. Mm. And if we're going to collaborate a lot, we need to look into history mm. and say models that have worked. And it goes to my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Panremo Nyado, when he was talking about domestic financing. Now, as early as 1974, even before the advent of primary health care, the Alma Hata Declaration, Botswana, because they had diamonds, had put into place systems where health care was free. And in there was the fact that every village chose, they were not chosen, community health care workers were chosen by the people themselves. You called a quota meeting, a big gathering, and every village chose six young people, men and women, who were going to be trained and work in terms of mobilization for whatever. At that time, just mobilization to ensure women had access to, 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 to prenatal care and all that. And this model worked to the point where when I became minister, 90% of the women could deliver in a health facility. Mm -hmm. When I left, it was 90%. And through community health care workers, we were more able to mobilize women for mother to child transmission, for even, even caring for, for mentally uh, you know, disabled uh, mm -hmm. you know, children, people in the home. To the point where within four years, we brought down mother to child transmission from 29% to less than 8%. And it was all in, you know, with the work of community health care workers, with a proper curriculum, well paid, and also with a good career progression. And half the time, that is not emphasized. You know, people who say they're paid, but paid what? Yes. These people were paid, they were hard, and you could actually even progress, and they were under the supervision of community health nurses. There's one color that has not been mentioned anywhere here. Mm. Nurses are the breadbone of any primary health care system. And if we don't know. mention them, then we might as well just be working, you know, whatever. But we need community health care nurses to be able to supervise. And also we need them to be able to be trained because right now, in Africa, there is a brain drain of nurses to foreign countries. Yes. And we need to take care of that. So we have a problem. And... Collaboration is fine, but we also need domestic financing. And that's why Botswana was the first country to, to reach the 95, 95, 95 UN type. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. She's the chair of our board of Society for Peace in Africa, the University of Icasa. We are lucky this uh, evening to have uh, two ministers, two past ministers here. We have David, uh, Dr. David Perotra, he's a former minister of Zimbabwe. You know, he, he was minister for 15 years in Zimbabwe. I'm sure that he has a lot to say. What I wanted to contribute is that, yeah, there's no way we can achieve the three zero if we really don't take care of community. And we have started a, 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 a program with uh, Stanley University and coalition police with Society for East in Africa to train the community health worker and to give them a certificate. You know, and we believe that uh, this certificate will improve the system of working in the health system and they can get a health pay. Because without them, there's no way, as my board has said, if we really don't train them and we don't supervise them with the nursing, there's no way we can achieve the three zero. That really is something that I want to share with you, that the program is going on now, and uh, you can check on our website. We see there are training program for certification for uh, a, a community health care worker in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Thank you for your collaboration on Zimbabwean. Hi. <clears throat> I do have a very quick question. Um, my name is Godfrey, and I'm a professor of health communication and community-based research um, at San Diego University. I grew up in Ghana. Um, I usually work with... Uh, LGBT uh, folks on the continent. Um, and so I, I didn't really care about a question I was asked earlier on about um, the professors who are coming in and working with union members and collaboration and, and all that. Um, my, my quick question though is that I feel like I see myself as a bridge um, in the United States. I do um, have access to like, university grad money sometimes. Um, and, and my challenge has been reaching out to sort of the government or the agencies on the continent trying to work with them and say, hey, I have a bridge in some way. 
I work here in the United States. However, I grew up on the continent. I know the local, I mean, know some of the local culture. Mm-hmm. And so, my question to you all is: What should be our role? Or how how do you how do you expect? Or what kind of expectations do you have for us in the the African academics in the diaspora? And how can we collaborate with you all up as well? Big th- thanks. That's a brilliant question, and I I think um, my short answer would be for you to build more bridges like you, and um, strictly speaking, it's about building technical expertise, right? So there is always, I I think one of the uh, people asked a patient mentioned this, there is that platform that says community has to be involved from the beginning. And um, fortunately, in the HVT and HPTN space, we do that authentically and earnestly. Uh, But I've been on a lot of platforms where that's just kind of like, let's just, it's a checklist. We did have a community person, and they're not really earnestly involved. But in other, if the people who are also called to the table don't have the expertise to contribute, or maybe feel um, incapacitated to make meaningful input, I think that's one of the places where we really lack. So if you kind of have the funding and you have the platforms, and if we could go ahead and identify more of these community people and build more bridges so that we can actually um, have the community participating meaningfully in the research space, that would be really fantastic. Uh, just to add, uh, Chair, uh, the bridge, I think, we, yeah, we need those bridges. But we also need programs that, that we can exchange programs between Appalachia and the Africa region. Yeah. Yeah, just to say, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Brad Hale. I'm a deputy principal for PEPFAR, the DOD PEPFAR. And just to respond to the gentleman here, actually, um, to say that uh, the Department, of, U.S. Department of Defense is part of PEPFAR and um, has been so from the beginning. And um, so this is not relevant to the United States because obviously PEPFAR is international. But um, uh, for all of this time that PEPFAR has existed is providing care for military healthcare assisting for that hurt. So just so, just to say that, uh, maybe that'll make you feel a little bit better. Anyway, that was it. All right, thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to really, I think, I'd like to thank you all. I, you know, you know, I love it. You know, I bother you with good ideas and sometimes bad ones. But Carl, thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming and, and sharing this time with us and kicking off this conference. The conversation of the folks from Appalachia, the folks on the continent, is critically important. I think we've got some good ideas on how to craft out some next steps and some frameworks. Uh, and again, thank you. Does anybody have any closing words they want to say? Thank the people. <laughs>